Stanford University. It is a great pleasure and privilege to introduce Simon Schaffer, Professor of History of Science in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at Cambridge, and this year's Harry Camp Memorial Lecturer. Schaffer, without a doubt, is one of the most respected, accomplished, and exciting historians of science working today. His best known work is Leviathan and the Air Pump, Hobbes, Boyle, and the Experimental Life, 1985, co-authored co with Stephen Shapin. This work is a landmark in the development of the social and cultural approach to the history of science dominant today. And in particular, it aims to give a social, historical, and political analysis of the rise of experimental science, as typified by Boyle's canonical experiments with the air pump. To this end, Shapin and Schaffer investigate less well-known contemporary alternatives to Boyle's interpretations of such experiments, especially those of Thomas Hobbes, and show in particular how Boyle's eventual triumph was inextricably connected with the political <coughs> challenges of Restoration England. Hobbes, as Shapin and Schaffer were the first to emphasize, was thus simultaneously a central political theorist of the Restoration and a key figure in the development of experimental science. Their book has been universally regarded ever since as, to quote Owen Hannaway, simply one of the most original, enjoyable, and important books published in the history of science in recent years. Shapin and Schaffer were awarded the prestigious Dutch Erasmus Prize for contributions to the humanities in 2005. <coughs> Schaffer's own work, however, ranges much more widely, including the history of Newtonian astronomy and Newtonian natural philosophy, experimental instrumentation, Darwin and other topics in Victorian science, medicine, time machines, and computing machines, and most recently, the role of scientific instruments in naval and maritime pursuits. I cannot even attempt to summarize Schaeffer's wide-ranging production, comprising some 120, and counting, articles and books. Instead, I will briefly touch on two of my particular favorites, both relevant to his ongoing interest in the history of Newtonian astronomy and natural philosophy. First, I cannot resist mentioning his early 1978 paper, The Phoenix of Nature, Fire and Evolutionary Cosmology in Wright and Kant, which provides a novel perspective on Immanuel Kant's early contributions to cosmology by comparing Kant's work in detail with that of the Englishman Thomas Wright. It is well known that Kant first derived his ideas on the Milky Way galaxy from Wright's earlier work but no one before Schaffer attempted a detailed comparison of Wright and Kant, paying particular attention to Wright's later unpublished manuscripts. In this way, in particular, Schaffer uncovers a further conceptual element that was necessary to transform the static Newtonian cosmology, stably maintained by the direct action of God, into a truly evolutionary account of the formation of galaxies and nebulae, namely the unique element of fire the matter of heat, which provided a crucial active agency within matter itself. But perhaps the most important of Schaffer's contributions to Newtonian studies so far is his 1989 paper, Glassworks, Newton's Prisms and the Uses of Experiment. This paper is another landmark in the new contextualist approach to the history of experiment, represented by Leviathan and the air pump but applied this time to a rather more ambitious case. Newton's famous experimentum crucis, demonstrating, according to Newton, the composition of sunlight out of simple, homogeneous, colored rays, distinguished by their differing degrees of refrangibility, as evidenced by different angles of refraction after going through the prism. Schaffer provides an extremely careful and thorough deconstruction of the transparent self-evidence this experiment was supposed to possess appealing in particular to Newton's early manuscript lectures, beautifully illustrating how the prism first became an experimental instrument and how doubts and unclarities concerning the details of Newton's preparation and manipulation of his prisms 
then needed urgently to be overcome. Indeed, the question of who had the most suitable prisms, Newton or his critics, continued to complicate the issue until well after the publication of Newton's optics. Schaffer's paper, to the best of my knowledge, is the richest historical analysis of Newton's experimentum crucis that has yet appeared. Today, however, Simon Schaffer has a still more ambitious target, Newton's mathematical principles of natural philosophy. I eagerly await what he has to say on the subject of Newton on the beach, the information order of Principia Mathematica. Thank you very much. Well, first, of course, I'm extraordinarily grateful and honored by the invitation to give this year's Harry Camp lectures here in Stanford. Nothing is more terrifying than an inductive series which includes E.P. Thompson and Edward Said and Anthony Grafton and Claude Levi-Strauss, of which I am supposed to be the next term. I'm also very honored indeed to be delivering lectures under the rubric of the concept of the dignity and worth of the individual. And I'll try to show in today's lectures, uh, in today's lecture and Wednesdays, um, that some of the work at least that I want to address with you addresses also that concept. Certainly, there's a connection between what I want to say this evening and the concept of the dignity and worth of the individual, because my talk focuses on an exemplary in an individual, Isaac Newton, and it attempts to address the nature of his individuality. I begin with this citation which in a strange way is from Newton. I don't myself believe that Newton ever said this, but it is the second most famous thing Newton ever said. <laughs> the most famous thing Newton ever said, he certainly wrote. That stuff about shoulders and giants, which Robert Merton so brilliantly analyzed. And I wish Merton had analyzed this too, because then my task would have been much easier than it is. Let me read it out. I know not how I may seem to the world, says Newton, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy, playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Now, there are several reasons, I won't bore you with them, why Newton couldn't possibly have said that. The most obvious is that it's poetic. <laughs> and it's literally poetic. The source text is Milton's Paradise Regained, that great um, meditation on the good old cause. The imagery of a boy playing with shells is taken from the conversation between Christ and Satan about the worthlessness, so Christ holds, of Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy, according to Milton's Christ, is like a boy playing on the seashore, diverting himself with shells. But my concern here is not with the poetics of this remarkable self-description. There is, by the way, another reason why Newton couldn't possibly have said this. It's modest. Rather, my concern is with a much more brutal biographical fact, which is that Newton never was on the seashore, and he never saw the ocean. He saw no tides, save along the Thames. He never used the moon to navigate at sea. He had no obvious interest in shells. He was no great traveler. He spent his entire life between Lincolnshire, Cambridge, and a number of London houses, pubs, and offices. In fact, as far as I've been able to ascertain, it's the sort of thing we social constructivists do, he is known to have been on a boat only once, and that was with Christian Herkens going upriver from Westminster to Hampton Court in summer 1689 to try and get a job. <laughs> 
So this is a man who, in many ways, did not move. As my colleague Rob Eiliff has shown, there was a very direct connection between this ingeniously worked image of seclusion and authority and the religious and cosmological program that Newton espoused. The wars of the learned, so Newton held, were due to making public what should be secreted, and the affairs of a corrupt state and church were poisonous for the pursuit of truth. In other words, nowhere and yet strangely everywhere, and indeed nowhere therefore everywhere, this Newtonian solitude allowed a kind of imitatio dei, an imitation of God. This was massively reinforced, as many of you will know, of course, in the iconography of the Newtonian project. Let me just run through some of that iconography <coughs> in a cavalier and barbarian way. This is the first and most important printed image of Newton. It's the frontispiece of the first English version of Principia, which was printed in London two years after Newton's death, and it shows Newton communing with an angel in heaven to whom he reveals and from whom he learns the truths of celestial physics. And that image is played on again and again from then on throughout the Aufklärung. In Giambattista Pittoni's magnificent uh, allegory to the memory of Sir Isaac Newton, which I've discussed elsewhere um, in my work that Michael treated so generously in the introduction on Newton's prism experiments, what you see here is the crucial experiment standing instead of Newton, who is nowhere to be seen in this image. Newton's ashes are in that urn and the ancients gawp at his triumph. But he's absent. And even when he's not absent, as here in Louis Boulet's magnificent project of the 1780s for a cenotaph in memory of Sir Isaac Newton, just to give you an idea of the scale, for those of you who haven't seen Pete Greenaway's masterpiece, The Belly of an Architect, these are fir trees. So that's the size of the, of the project. And there again, Newton's tomb solitude and cosmology welded together. This image barely needs a gloss. Blake's magnificent image of 1795, an image of catastrophic solitude, but solitude and withdrawal nevertheless. And finally, my favorite, George Schaff's project of 1839, tragically never built, um, to construct a kind of Boulay-esque monument over Newton's house in Kensington. Um, so this is, a, this is a street in Kensington, and this is what would have been built over it had Scharf had his way. What's that iconography about? It's about solitude and immobility. And the iconography of Newton's solitude and immobility, of course, must seem all the more striking, because his program launched in the mid-1680s and under revision for the next three decades, so evidently mastered a global creation involving the heights of tides, the lengths of pendulums, positions of comets and moons, the tales of well-traveled mariners and missionaries and merchants and mercenaries, and I couldn't think of anybody else whose name begins with M. The divine Newton then could describe how bodies acted on each other instantly and at a distance precisely because he could act instantly and at a distance without any mediation. But immediate action at a distance is not, sadly, a plausible historical nor sociological principle. So my aim briefly here is to use this figure of the Newtonian individual, the Newtonian solitary, to examine the emergence and workings of other systems of knowledge in early modern natural philosophy. 
his Principia must stand as the glorious testimony to the achievement of a putatively cloistered analyst of the mathematics of motion. The telltale remark about the playful beachcomber and the ocean of truth helps underwrite, I believe, the notion that nothing like testimony or reportage or trust or storytelling can ever play a consequential role in the Newtonian triumph, nor perhaps if one follows the Hewelian lesson about the emergent necessity of permanent sciences, could it play such a role in any successfully completed analytical science. So part of the provocation of my project is a desire to put Newton back on the beach where he belongs, and part of it is to analyze what recent scholars have called the information order in which his masterpiece was produced. The contrast in iconography needs perhaps a little emphasis. So here's the contrasting case. Um, this is a magnificent image from Hanover uh, of Leibniz choosing between the ancient and the modern philosophy, a task which, as you see, for the Enlightenment, must take place on your own. You can't make that choice in company. And the contrast is between this notion of Epicurean withdrawal and the extraordinary mobility of a figure like Leibniz. Those are Leibniz's journeys during his lifetime, and the, the contrast with Newton is extremely marked. I mean, on this map, Newton moves basically in a small circle around London. So that's the kind of contrast which I want to make something of, the contrast between those kinds of displacements and the way in which scholarship focuses on the extreme solitude, withdrawal, and individuation of Newton working uh, alone in Trinity College in Cambridge in these rooms next to Wren's Chapel. Okay, so that's the premise in every sense. Now what do I mean by information order such that Principia Mathematica could possess one? Well, as many of my colleagues in the history of science and several people in this room have shown us, Long-range systems that allowed the accumulation of facts and commodities were decisive aspects of the knowledge order of this period. In her brilliant analysis of what she calls the information ceremonies of the old regime, the historian Michel Fogel shows how control over the production of information was surrounded with complex rituals where the state's power was both dramatized and reinforced. Larry Stewart has demonstrated beyond dispute the entanglement of Newtonian natural philosophy with the commercial and trade revolutions of Georgian Britain, and he's pursued these insights into the newly globalized trade networks Britain's empire then established. These historians and others have brought out the spatial, the political, the commercial dimensions of early modern knowledge regimes. And of course, Londa Schiebinger's recent edited collection with Claudia Swan on colonial botany does precisely that for a vast area of the natural historical enterprise. Information for these studies is a term designed to capture something somewhat more broadly shared and less challenged than formalized knowledges. So I want to invert, in some sense, an intuitive contrast to which we might too hastily subscribe. It seems to me information might be helpful here because it inverts a received hierarchy. Information, let me push this paper boat onto the ocean of truth, would be the commonly taken for granted, rather less disputed and less disputable material. Knowledge would look more mutable, its status certainly more debatable. So one of the historians whose work I'm absolutely drawing on here, Chris Bailey, sorry, Sir Christopher Bailey, um, historian of um, Britain and India, has pointed out 
that in early modern societies, I'm quoting from him, the information order was decentralized, consisting of many overlapping knowledge-rich communities. Okay, now within the information order, there were what Peter Burke has called information brokers. Their names are very familiar to us, as protagonists of the knowledge regime which matters for Newtonianism. Bacon, Mersenne, Hartlib, Renaudot, Colbert, Oldenburg, Leibniz, Sloan. And they functioned in an information order which sometimes called itself the Republic of Letters, in which there was print commerce and stock investment, news books, subscription systems, and encyclopedias. And the reason why we might want to attend to these information orders is that they were themselves part of the nascent iconography through which early modern societies represented global networks. And again, I will in a barbarian fashion run through a series of fairly familiar images, each of which would deserve a Harry Camp lecture to itself. Jost Amann's magnificent allegory of trade made for Antwerp in the late 1500s with an image of the world and the city of Antwerp, the fountain of trade, the arms of the guilds and each of the crafts of the city, the noble families and their coats of arms, an entire representation of an information and commercial order. Athanasius Kircher's great Jesuit horoscope of 1646, um, which represents a global network in a way that my friend Bruno Latour can only dream of, <laughs> since for each Jesuit base there is um, a sundial shown which allows the calculation of universal and local time and yet organized in arboreal and hierarchical form. Or this image, again very familiar, from um, Samuel Purchas, Haclitus Posthumus, uh, which organizes the Protestant and English project as a providential revelation of a vast history of naval networking extending from Noah's Ark to Francis Drake and everything in between. And then the single most familiar representation of the global basis of knowledge, the uh, iconography that Francis Bacon ripped off from the Habsburg programs of Spanish conquest. I show these because I just want to remind us of the self-consciousness in the culture that we're trying to characterize, of the globalized forms through which information was accumulated, extracted, distributed, exchanged, and judged. That's important for my argument. But alongside what we might call the sublime of information orders, there is, of course, the satire of information orders. Sorry. So this print by Václav Holá, great bohemian uh, draftsman, made in 1642, Wenceslas Holá, the world is governed by opinion, takes exactly the same thematics and inverts it. Information and intelligence is subversive, it's unreliable, as the events of the South Sea bubble showed. There's an information catastrophe in Newton's period. And that catastrophe hinged on the difficulty of parsing reliable from unreliable knowledge. Information and intelligence were unstable and hard to judge. Think, for example, of the contrast between the work of Dutchmen such as Kempfer, who reported the most bizarre facts about Japanese religious ceremonies, and the pseudo-Formosan George Psalmanazar, who reported that his alleged home the island of Formosa hosted ghastly rituals of infant sacrifice and cannibalism. This was what was called paper fuel, that was the phrase, for news books and coffee houses. So take this example. This is um, 
the alphabet of the language of Formosa according to the uh, pseudo-Formosan George Salmanazar. He was in fact, where in 1704, a uh, Avignon-born lapsed Jesuit who pretended to be from Taiwan and arrived in London in the summer of 1704, was introduced, of course, to the president of the Royal Society, Isaac Newton, and immediately published a history and what we might now call ethnography of the island of Formosa, including its alphabet and a map of where it is. All this was fake, but that was not obvious, and especially it was not obvious to English academics Salman Azar was immediately given a job as a lecturer in Formosan at the University of, thank goodness, Oxford. <laughs> but one had to discriminate between this representation and this one, which is also a map of Japan and the islands to the east of Japan, and you'll recognize it as the frontispiece of volume three of Gulliver's Travels. And this, which is Scheutzer's map of Japan, dedicated to Sir Hans Sloan, president of the Royal Society, in succession to Newton. And Londoners were asked to judge whether this representation of a Japanese priest is less or more plausible than Salman Azar's representation of a Formosan one. I show you these then to remind us that not only were information orders fundamental for the accumulation of knowledge, but they were simultaneously recognized as being the source of chaos, catastrophe, and difficult judgment. Now, in tracing these networks of trade and knowledge in their regulative work, it seems to me we need first to follow the suggestions of recent historians of the process, Hal Cook, Steve Harris, and others. In his provocative analysis of the interaction between Dutch merchant enterprise and natural history, Cook rightly points out to us how collective and creditworthy accumulation of goods and information characterized the Dutch economic system and its knowledge regime too. Inventory investment, the invention of maintenance technologies, as he calls it, of storage and classing and warehousing were simultaneously systems of knowledge accumulation and systems of world making, so Hal rightly argues, whether in libraries or gardens, pharmacies or museums. Similarly, Steve Harris uses the career of the Dutch East India Company alongside those of the Spanish and of Jesuit long-range knowledge networks to show us the ways in which travel, expropriation, and accumulation provided both the social modes of existence of the early modern capitalist system and the knowledge regime of crucial institutions. Bluntly, credit was, after all, how these goods were got and accumulated and how they were defined as goods. And this was the period, precisely this period, when credit moved easily between being the name of a fiscal virtue, the positive side of a bank account. That's how Daniel Defoe invents the term in the 1710s and 20s. And the trustworthiness of a knowledge claim, too. So having established ways in which information orders were both fundamental and vulnerable, we need to turn, I think, precisely to Newton's rather idiosyncratic predicament. And I say idiosyncratic because here I want to emphasize how pervasive the gap between Newton's project and what I've just been talking about has been in historiography. That seems very striking to me, as we will see. So even Steve Harris's otherwise brilliant exploration of long-range corporations in the networking of early modern knowledge regimes draws this distinction. What Steve does in his magnificent article is to invite us to map the provenance of all the constituents of an early modern scientific text. So think of an early modern scientific text, 
now draw lines from every fact claim and every object and every image to their source, and you will have mapped the global trade network. So what Harris is telling us is that there was an unprecedented early modern explosion in mobility, and this is what helped make the knowledge regime of the period. And then he draws a contrast. He draws a specific contrast between the vast extent of, as example, Nehemiah Grew's Museum Societatis Regalis, in other words, the catalogue of the Museum of the Royal Society, which would extend across the globe, given what was present in that museum, and what Steve imagines to be the, quote, very small region of the globe traced by the provenance roots of Newton's Principia. And he's wrong about that. Even Homer nods. By relocating Newton's masterpiece, one can correct the errors of an historiography which draws such harsh distinctions between, as it were, the successive presidents of the Royal Society, between Newton and the naturalist Hans Sloane, between natural philosophy and curiosity, between astronomy and natural history. So, let me leap forward to Newton. What I've done here, because I'm weird, is to plot on the, a map of the voyages of Robinson Crusoe, which, was, which accompanied the second edition, the 1727 edition of Defoe's uh, story, um, the data points in the third book of Newton's Principia, the third edition of which came out in the same month as Robinson Crusoe. So the green blobs are places where stuff happens that Newton describes in the Principia. And the line, this line, is Robinson Crusoe's travels around the world. And I want to begin with this map when thinking about Newton simply to show you, almost apodictically, the global distribution of the Principia Mathematica read as text. It is as though this work, which is clearly fundamental, paradigmatic for the mathematical principles of natural philosophy, can also be read, not instead, it must also be read as a text in natural history. That's my claim. If we uh, increase the focus a bit, this is a map of three kinds of data which Newton uses in Principia Mathematica. The red blobs are observations of the heights of tides. The blue blobs are observations of the position of comets. And the green blobs are observations of the length of a pendulum that beats at the rate of one second per beat. And we'll see in a moment why that might be an interesting parameter. But what I want to point out here is that this is the Atlantic Triangle. Newton is absolutely relying on the work of the Middle Passage, on the work of the Royal Africa Company, and on the work of the Compagnie de Senegal. So that the movement between the Atlantic littoral, the transatlantic trade, and the tobacco colonies in New England is the system on which Newton's data mainly relies. And one needs to think that partly when one is trying to make sense of what Newton does in the third book of the Principia. The final book, the third book as it now is, the third volume of the Principia, is a book of assays of degrees and seconds and miles and inches and observers and experimenters and readers. Splendidly, the third volume, which is called The System of the World, was first introduced, and significantly so, to make the Principia more popular. I love that fact. Unlike the preceding material on the laws of motion that Newton feared 
quote, may have appeared dry and barren, unquote, this book, The System of the World, demanded detailed assays of information from a very wide range of observers. It was written in just under 12 months during uh, the period up to the end of 1685 in the room that I showed you earlier, and it was, I quote, to demonstrate the frame of the system of the world composed in a popular method that it might be read by many, unquote. Newton's first editor, Edmund Halley, naval officer, drunk, Tory astronomer, reckoned in June 1686 in a letter to Newton that, quote, the application of this mathematical part to the system of the world is what will render it acceptable to all and much advance the sale of the book, unquote. So what was Newton doing here? He was applying the geometrical principles of unresisted motion under central forces to planets, moons, tides, and comets. And therefore, it was in this book that Newton faces the problem of handling others' numbers. Numbers made by astronomers and Jesuits, horribile dictu, professors, academicians, sailors. And it was this book that drew attention when his second editor, the genial Roger Coates, began to rework the entire program between 1709 and 1713. Newton and Coates, concerned with geographical knowledge, were also concerned with assessing observers' credit, especially their reports of where comets were, how high the sea rose, and how pendulums responded to the force of gravity. Since the rate at which a pendulum beats, they reckoned, is a good measure of how strongly an object is being pulled by the Earth, they called this problem, marvelously for me, the French dilemma because of the variation between different measures of pendulum lengths reported by Frenchmen. So it's suggestive, to me at least, that this final book raises so clearly issues of trust and credit and global information and reader response. And what I want to do very quickly now is to run through the three cases that I've mapped on this Atlantic chart. First, the tides. So here is the text of the first proposition of the third book on the tides to find the force of the moon which raises the sea. And you immediately see what Newton is doing in this text. What he wants is to have a good value for the force of the moon and of the sun, L and S, you can probably just see that, which is the force that they're exerting when the tide is at its highest, and when they pull in opposite directions, in which case one has lunar minus sol. And from that, one could get the ratio of the tide-raising power of the moon to the tide-raising power of the sun, and that would allow one to calculate the precession of the equinoxes and a whole range of other variables that matter. But in order to get the ratio of the highest observed tide to the lowest observed tide, you have to trust men like Samuel Sturmey and Samuel Colpress, Sam Colpress in Plymouth, Sam Sturmey in Bristol. Are they reliable observers? No. This is Samuel Sturmey, who looks very reliable, it seems to me, in this image. And this is his tide book, the Mariner's Magazine, with its splendid frontispiece. And this is the book that Newton and Halley and Coates analyze for the trustworthiness of their tidal data. Sturmey writes about how he's measured the tides, but above all, 
who he's talked to. He's visited marshes where, and I quote, the sea being kept out with great earth walls that it do not at high water overflow the level and the inhabitants' livelihood depending most on sheep they are, as you may believe they have reason to be, very vigilant and observant at what times they are most in danger of having their animals drowned. And I find them generally agreed by their constant observations and experience dearly bought, both for them and their sheep, that their times of danger are the beginning of November and of February. And it's on this basis that Sturmey reports in late 1668 on the crucial data for Newton about the time and height differences between the highest and lowest tides, reporting his observations as around about 45 feet. So that number... 45 becomes the crucial number in Newton's Principia. Newton didn't only rely or discuss, however, questions of the ratio of the lunar to the solar force. He also, for the first time in history, produced numerical models of what's called tidal interference. The most spectacular example of that takes place in the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, and it was observed by the English because Tonkin was one of the most important trading bases of the East India Company. The mouth of the Red River that flows down from Hanoi into the Gulf of Tonkin experiences not two but one tide a day. And the height of that tide varies sinusoidally with the position of the moon. Newton engaged in a virtuoso mathematical analysis of how that could be and why, using the superposition of different tidal flows around islands on the southern China coast. What was his data source? His data source was an American, a Boston mariner called Francis Davenport, who, as I've mapped here, was in the East Indies as a pilot for P-I-L-O-T, a pilot for the East India Company. He came back to London in 1685 and brought with him reports of this tidal marvel, and that's why Newton analyzed it. But his source, there were two problems with this data for Newton. One, Davenport's source was, to quote his book, the subtle Tonkin pilots who exaggerate the shifts of tides only to prevent their being kicked out of employment wherein yet with safety the best of them all cannot be wholly relied on. So what Davenport was saying is there is this tidal strangeness, this marine monstrosity, but don't trust it because it's actually an exaggeration by pilots who know they'd otherwise be sacked. Secondly, Davenport was in London because he was on trial. He was on trial because he was helping a pirate with the marvellous name of Siamese White, who was based at Mergui here and had organized the complete destruction of the East India Company base there. So Davenport's reputation was, to put it mildly, dodgy. A newspaper which Newton collected describes Davenport thus. This vile wretch on whose evidence the company have so much depended, is one of the most notorious rogues in nature, and so esteemed by all honest men that have ever had the unhappiness ever to have been concerned or acquainted with him." Unquote. Not for the last time, of course, a dubious report from the Gulf of Tonkin by an ugly American had to be checked for its creditworthiness. Edmund Halley, sorry that dates me, 
a veteran of the East India Company's ships, and thus Newton had to depend on what this vile wretch said, and they analysed his numbers in great detail while glossing in manuscript the way in which they were analysing his credibility. We see very similar kinds of analysis in the case of Newton's work on comets. I will not go into detail here. We can discuss this after, if you wish. Newton's informants about cometary position were ideally required to have made remarkably accurate observations of cometary positions because Newton's project was, again unprecedentedly, to analyse the elliptical paths of comets on the basis of observations of a single transit. So here, Newton is analysing the, comet of, the great comet of November 1680 through March of 1681, using observations from Winthrop in Boston in New England, from planters in in the, on the Jamaican slave plantations, and from his kinsman Arthur Storer, who grew tobacco on the Patuxent River near Hunting Creek in Maryland on the Virginian border, to whom he'd sent a rather fine telescope with which to make precisely this kind of observation. Newton turned himself into a centre of calculation. This is a drawing by Newton of one of his colleagues' um, descriptions of the comet over King's College Chapel. So that's a Newton drawing of King's College Chapel. This is the kind of incoming data that Newton was working on, but he was also having to use images like this. So this is an astrological image of the same comet, and as Lorraine Daston and others have taught us, it's an image which talks about the superstitious belief in cometary eggs, weird stones impressed with images when comets transit, and Newton had to analyse this image for the numerical positions, which um, was a challenge and a half. He also, did Newton, organised what we might call cometary journeys. He sent Edmund Halley into the Baltic to visit Hevelius and towards Italy simply to gather reliable cometary numbers. This is not the image of Newton that we normally think of then. This is not the isolated, cloistered and sequestered figure of tradition. Rather, this is a man organising a global, large-scale information network. Finally, let me turn to the question of the length of pendulums. As I've said, this was the most crucial data with which Newton was working in the final book of the Principia. Because the length of a pendulum clock that beats regularly seconds as it beats, measures, so Newton was innovatively arguing, the force of gravity at that point. And Newton reckoned that because of gravitation, the Earth is figured oblate like this, in other words, like a pumpkin rather than like a melon, and therefore seconds pendulums should be made shorter, nearer the equator, because the force of gravity near the equator is weaker. And these are the numbers with which Newton was working. These are the numbers generated principally by the French slave system, by the French plantation system. This is the French problem. The French problem is, do these numbers, those in blue appear in the first edition of the Principia, those in red, are added in the second and third. Do these numbers justify the inference that pendulum clocks must be shortened when you get nearer the e equator? That's a matter of testimonial analysis, of assaying. So, for example, Herchen's observation of his seconds pendulums in Den Haag, in The Hague, 
has the length of a second's pendulum as three feet eight and a half inches. That of Richet, Jean Richet, at Cayenne, very near the equ equator, has a second's pendulum of length three foot seven inches and seven twentieths of a line. So that looks good. But many of these numbers look bad. And as Nicholas Dew has pointed out in a very important recent article analyzing the observation of the Compagnie de Senegal, de A, and the eminent minim observer, Louis Foyer, these numbers don't fit with the Newtonian model at all. In Paris, the chief French astronomer Cassini simply denied that there is a variation in the length of pendulums that beat seconds. He saw, did Cassini, this range of numbers as an entirely local and contingent, uneven fact uh, related principally to tropical heat, on which the French have always been experts, and on the force of the wind, on which perhaps they've also always been experts. <laughs> However, what Newton did was, as you might expect, to take the Huygens and Richet observations, this is the frontispiece, the magnificent vignette of Richet's astronomical and physical observations made on the Isle of Cayenne, very seriously, and to reject all the others. What does he say in his gloss on these questions? This disagreement must arise from the errors of the observers, from the dissimilitude of the internal parts of the earth, the height of mountains, the different temperatures of the air, and the untrustworthiness of these kinds of travelers. Newton makes a, uh -oh, don't even think about it. Cool. Um, these, this is Louis Foyer's observation of an animal one finds in the River Plate, in the Rio Plata. It's a magnificent, fully folded out plate that Newton had in his copy of Foyer's observations, and it's annotated sic est. In other words, it's like this. Newton used the incredibility of these kinds of stories to undermine the trustworthiness of the observations the Minim was making about the length of his clock. In other words, and finally, in all sorts of ways, all right, log out is timed out, good, excellent. Finally, what Newton is doing in collaboration with his editors, with men like Halley and Coates, with a vast number of informants, is to make a judgment of an information order of a global scale. And it seems to me that if we take that kind of system of Newtonianism seriously, we have a much more accurate account of where Newton is when he's forging the masterpiece that is the Principia. Here's my coda. At the period when Newton was writing Principia in its first edition, he was, as we now know extremely well, also drafting increasingly lengthy descriptions of heaven and of the New Jerusalem in his now well-known manuscripts interpreting the apocalypse and the day of judgment. And there's a passage which has always fascinated me in Newton's writings where he describes the heavenly city and what it is like and what it will be like to live there. And this, unlike the statement with which I began, is ipsissima verba. This is Newton describing heaven. As the planets remain in their orbs, he writes in 1685, so may any other bodies subsist at any distance from the earth, and much more will beings who have the power of self-motion move where they will, place themselves where they will, and continue in any region of the heaven whatsoever, whatever, 
there to enjoy the society of one another and by their messengers or angels to rule the earth and converse immediately with the remotest regions and to have thus the liberty or dominion to move through the whole heavens and the choice of the happiest places for abode seems to me a greater happiness than to be confined forever to any one place. That's a better description of the Newtonian project than that image of the boy and the shells on the beach. Thank you. Simon. Um, sorry, I don't have a level here. <clears throat> Simon has kindly agreed, this may not be on, to answer questions. And Matthew Tews and I have uh, cordless microphones because this room is extremely dead. So uh, we will call roughly on people on alternate sides of the room by passing them the mics. So if you'll put your hands up when you want to ask questions. We'll give you the wherewithal. Please don't try to ask a question without the mic. It just doesn't work in this room. So, uh, Matthew, do you want to start on the other side? And we'll... Questions? Uh, thank you. We, we talked uh, at, uh, in the afternoon about uh, the the Senegalese man mm -hmm. coming from the river, mm -hmm. and uh, we bring some knowledges uh, in in Britain. I would like uh, uh, to say more about that. Yeah, say more about that. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. So, what I f what this version of the talk embarrassingly omits, of course is what this kind of information order would have seemed like to informants. That's to say, agents treated as informants within this system. I've given you an extraordinarily centripetal picture of the information order which Newton, Halley, and Coates developed. They are the analysts. So here's an example which I think is familiar, but I also think is very important, of an agent whose pathways clearly intersect with the information order that I've described, but for whom things must have seemed very different. His name, as far as the English was concerned, um, was Solomon Ibn Jalla. Um, he was uh, from uh, the Senegal Valley. He was born, presumably, in the middle of the 1670s. He was taken as a slave from the French slaving base at Gorre to Martinique in the 1690s, and then liberated and ends up in London in 1698, where he lived for 15 years. And his work in London was to act, first of all, as a translator, and then as an agent, and then as a collector, for Newton and for Sir Hans Sloan, Newton's, for Sir Hans Sloan, Newton's successor as president of the Royal Society, the most eminent naturalist of the age. And um, Jalla was clearly an absolutely indispensable translator, intermediary, and interpreter for a large number initially of Sloan's and then magnificently for, uh, in, in initially and briefly for Newton and then much more ex extensively for Sloan. Not only in terms of collecting, judging and assaying objects in cabinets that Sloan would purchase or assess or buy and then display at his house in Chelsea, but also I think fascinatingly, which is one of the things we were talking about earlier, um, he was a translator. He would translate Arabic texts as well as those from the West African literal. And then in the 1720s, by which time we can estimate he must have been in his uh, 60s, he returned to the Senegal 
through Gore. He was taken there on an English ship of the Royal Africa Company and acted for the next decade as an agent for English collectors. And then he's lost to history after that. It's an extraordinary career. It's been well documented by a number of extremely eminent Africanist historians. But what I think it reminds us of is that I wanted to stress for us the way in which the Atlantic Triangle, the system of exterminism and exploitation, which is also a system of commodity circulation and knowledge accumulation, has as information brokers traveling around it, not just, and perhaps not even mainly, the kind of protagonist that I've been describing in my talk. I think that's the possibility that's raised there. And what we were talking about before the show started, earlier to, today, was the necessity to begin exploring European archives, especially the Anglo-French archives, clearly. And this has begun to be done, of course, by several people here, as well as historians who've worked much more seriously on this than I have. But to use those archives to recover and reconstitute information orders as they would have seemed out with the kind of networks that Newton and Sloan were themselves manipulating. And I think that's a very important reminder of what sorts of imbalances were in play in the kind of assay of knowledge that we've been discussing this evening. So thanks a million for that. What's the story about how the quote about the boy on the shore got attributed to Newton? Okay, the check is in the post. I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, okay. This is a statement which first appears in any written form at all 18 months after Newton's death in the conversation book of a gossipy, slightly eccentric Oxford journalist, if it's not anachronistic to use that word. Um, and he was collecting material for a biography of Newton. So he keeps a diary, which is essentially a, a conversation book. In other words, records of remarks people have made about Newton, remarks that <coughs> Newton himself has made, obiter dicta, table talk, and so on and so forth. And it's immediately attributed to Newton. Then it's printed for the first time in a book by the absolutely remarkable Jacobite, Freemason, and uh, globetrotter Andrew Ramsey in a book called A Plan of Education for a Young Prince, which was printed in 1732. And already the sentence has changed, I mean, within a few years, right? The sentence is now, so listen carefully, please. As Sir Isaac Newton said, all the discoveries mortals can make are like those of a child on the borders of the sea that has only cracked some pebbles and opened some shells to see what is in them while there lies beyond him a boundless ocean of which he has no idea. So that looks a little more plausible to me because it's whatever else it is, it's not modest, right? Um, nor particularly poetic. I mean, the uh, grammar has already collapsed. And the source text there is no longer so clearly Paradise Regained, but clearly 1 Corinthians. We now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. I mean, that's what Ramsey is doing with this text. And that's the version that then became canonical. Right? So that it's that version that appears, for example, in Don Juan, in Byron's Don Juan, in David Brewster's Memoirs of the Life of Newton in the 1830s, and so on and so on and so on, all the way up to and including its magnificently tortuous reappearance in Wordsworth's Prelude. Um, uh, looking forth from my, okay, this is a challenge. Looking forth from my room at night, I could see the chapel where the statue stood of Newton with his prism and his silent face. The marble index of a solitary mind voyaging across oceans of truth alone. Right. So the Fortuna 
of this text is absolutely fascinating, it seems to me, which is one of the reasons why I'm glad you asked. This is fascinating. Um, and what I find fascinating is looking at the mathematics through a social context in the way you're doing right. it. So seeing the Principia as a text in natural history. Right. Is your claim only for the third book, or how far does your claim go? Oh, right, okay. Uh, no, the claim is not only for the third book. I think the, I mean, for the claim to have legs, it has to embrace the whole project. Right? Otherwise, I think it doesn't work. Right? On the contrary, we would be reinstalling precisely the contrast that your work and Paula's work and you know, Ben Schmidt's work and so on has been trying to overcome. I mean, we would actually perversely have reinforced that distinction. First you do the analysis, then you find it out. Right? Um, what matters there is the conjunctural analysis of the way in which the Principia is put together as project. And there, it seems to me, historiographically, we, I'm now going to go into deep, obscure mode. Okay? We have to go back to what Tom Whiteside taught us a generation ago about how the Principia was made, and that's the second part of this paper. Um, what Tom Whiteside, great historian of Newtonian, the great historian and editor of Newtonian mathematics, showed us a generation ago in an article in 1970, which is still not read enough, called uh, Before the Principia, is that there is no material in Newton in the manuscripts before the summer of 1684 that remotely resembles anything substantial that one finds in the Principia Mathematica. That's an extraordinarily remarkable claim. The analogy would be say, with the composition of The Origin of Species, it is as if the 1844 Species book and the notebooks of 1837 and 8, when Darwin comes back from the Beagle voyage, don't exist, that they'd never been written, as though Darwin had put together the great argument, as he calls it, in the 18 months before the summer of 1858, when Alfred Russell Wallace horrifyingly announces uh, his paper on the law of species indefinitely to depart from their type. Now that's the story about Newton, however, that the entire project is put together in 30 months, more or less without any substantial reflection on the problem. Now if that's true, and I believe that it's true, then the project to develop a rational mechanics of unresisted motion the forging of the notion of centripetal force, which is his <coughs> neologism. There is no such thing as the word centripetal before uh, September of 1684. Happens in step with the material that I've been describing here. If that were not so, this argument would be rivetingly interesting, but actually pretty weak. The reason I think the argument can be made strong is that the data accumulation and assaying is happening at the same time as the forging of the basic building blocks of what we now see in the second half of book one and the first half of, book, of what is now book two, that is to say on unresisted and resisted motion. And, those, and the, the three building blocks are um, the area law is a, is a clock, the um, Kepler systems can be generalized to universal gravitation, which is an extraordinary and counterintuitive thought, since Kepler systems should be autonomous for them to be um, accurate. And finally, perhaps most importantly, um, you can derive the inverse square law from the data, and you can derive the data from the inverse square law, which is an extremely radical claim indeed. All of that must be being put together at the same time as the data is being analyzed. And then what we have from 1685 onwards is a separation, right? These are actually teased apart into a treatise called The Motion of Bodies and a treatise called The System of the World, which, as I said, is initially written in popular discursive form, right? And then it has to be recast for reasons it would be too complicated to go into. So I think that's a very long-winded way of saying yes. 
Yeah, I have a question about the creditworthiness of informants. Um, I was wondering what would you say made particular numbers acceptable or unacceptable to Newton? Um, it sounded like uh, it wasn't their provenance. I mean, it sounded pretty clearly like it, it wasn't where they, who they were coming from. But then in that case, if it was just whether or not they fitted with his theory, then creditworthiness doesn't really enter in. That's a, um, so that's I, my question. I think that's an extremely interesting question. Um, I think three things are going on, to be quicker. One, provenance does matter a lot, right? Um, immediate empirical acquaintance is very, very important as criterion of assay. But judging the immediacy of empirical acquaintance is itself a judgment on testimony, right? That's a very obvious, but perhaps, you know, easy to miss point. So were you really there? Um, and it may not be the numbers then, I mean the quantitative assays which are being judged, but the utility of this provenance is being judged in, in exactly the way that scholars have recently made us familiar with. Right? So there's, there's that point. So a very good number from someone who, where it's extraordinarily unlikely that they themselves have Im immediate acquaintance isn't, isn't a usable number. And one can show that. I mean, I, I showed that in a number of cases. The second point, uh, which is, again, a very obvious point, is that um, I wanted to show you the way in which he's actively trying to recruit data. This is not a passive isolated center of calculation who simply relies on what can be gathered by bricolage in a small market town in the East Midlands. Right? There is an active program from 1684 through 1687 and even more so for the second edition, much more so for the second edition with codes, so 1704 on to 1711 and 1713, to bring data in. Right? And the third argument is I think the cause is the causus belli here now, because uh, as you will know very, very well, um, the, the dominant canonical way of reading these cruces in the third book was given to us by the late Professor Westfall in an extraordinary article called Newton and the Fudge Factor, first published in American Scientist, where what Sam did was to show exactly how much manipulation Newton was engaging in on the face of the page, at least on the face of the drafts that, that we've got. In these cases, in the case of observations of the speed of sound, and so on, right? And I'm much moved, I mean, of, of course, I'm much moved by Westfall's an analysis because he's the master of those that know about Newton. However, what I think one should say about that is not the, the, the kind of quasi-denunciatory tone in which that article is written, but to notice something completely fundamental, which Stephen Stigler and others have pointed out, which is that Newton has no concept of error. That's the point, right? If two numbers are going, I mean, if one number is going to be evidence for a theoretically derived number, they must be identical to any number of sig significant figures. Otherwise, they are not evident, right? And that presses on the testimonial relation enormously, right? So the 9 over 5, you know, 45 or, there, or thereabouts, is going to become very quickly in the calculation a number in six significant figures, Right? So you, you move from Sam Sturmey talking to some sheep farmers in Bristol to you know, f 9 over 5 and then 9 and 2 thirds over 5 and an eighth and, then, and so on and so on. Right? So it's the way in which we don't have a concept of reasonable agreement here that I find the most interesting thing to think about. And Jed Buchwald and Moti Feingold are working exactly on this problem now, so I understand, um, which is you know, way beyond my capacity, which is to try and write. This is what we have to do, coming back to Londa's point. We, what we need, and we don't have, amazingly, for early modern exact sciences yet, is, it seems to me, 
a reasoned history of the notion of agreement. We don't have that yet. Right? We don't know yet quite, and we will when Jed and Moti do this, what counts as agreement be between two numbers. I mean, go through those avalanches of new numerical tables from Galileo and the Jesuits through Hooke and Boyle to Newton. What, what is going on there? Right? And we've never really done that, which is extraordinary, it seems to me. Right? Even Coiré, who founded this project, never did that. Right? Rather, for Coiré, this was simply a story of the end of the regime of à peu près. That's how he <coughs> puts it. But we, we need something much more than that. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.